When we talk about early years education, we're talking about the formative years uh, for children's schooling, particularly between the ages of naught and five. There is a, a disproportionate number of men in the early years workforce. Uh, they represent 2% of the workforce, which means that 98% uh, are female. There are a number of reasons why there are so few men that work in the early years sector. Uh, one is about pay, because the early years is typically poorly paid. The second reason is about fear of abuse. So men are deterred because of media sensational headlines about men. Um, who are found to be paedophiles. There are other reasons that include a lack of stimulation or perceived stimulation for them in the earlier sector. You know, all you're doing is counting to five and playing with paint. There's a, an issue about masculinity, that working in the early years challenges your masculinity, that um, you have more female traits than male traits, um, and some men are, are sort of deterred from entering the, the sector. And there are issues about status, that the early years has quite a low status from an employment perspective. Um, and so men consider other forms of employment as a result of that. There are a number of um, reasons that are attributed to this. The first is about the gender gap that exists between boys and girls. And the argument is, is that if we don't have more male practitioners working in the sector, then they're not in a position to be able to help boys and motivate them with their learning. There is a suggestion that because there are so many women that work in the sector, they will practice in very feminized ways. So we'll sort of buy into more indoor activities, quiet activities, artistic activities, group activities, talking activities that switch boys off. And so the idea is, is if you bring a man into the classroom, they can bring more energy and vibrancy, take the children outdoors and stimulate them in terms of the ways that boys particularly want to learn. Because there are so many children who are growing up in single parent families, there is a perception that uh, boys particularly are being disadvantaged by not having many father figures in their lives. And so by bringing more men into the early years sector, they can serve as a, a surrogate dad or a replacement father for them to help them to become a man and, and understand what it means, you know, in terms of being male. But also, and most prominently, there is this idea of the need, particularly for young children, especially boys, to um, have exposure to male role models. And that's where men particularly serve as that role. There is evidence from the Office of National Statistics that suggests that children are three times more likely to be growing up in single parent families uh, than they were in the 1970s, which sort of fuels this moral panic that boys are being disadvantaged by not having stable males in their lives. But there's a challenge to this because children will encounter men in lots of different ways in their daily life, uh, be it the man who's driving the bus or the shopkeeper or the caretaker in the school setting. And men that exist as part of the sort of wider family makeup, be they grandparents or brothers or uncles. So there is exposure to uh, men for, for children. It's not just about the father figures, the most important thing. Personally, I don't think there is. I think it's more about the practitioner and their abilities to practice. My research has found that it isn't about gender that's the most important thing. It's about your ability to actually work effectively with young children, that you embrace the best pedagogical practices, the best theoretical ideas, the best resources, and use those to stimulate children in their learning. There's a danger that men are employed simply based on their biological sex. And there is no evidence that suggests that men are better practitioners than women.
if that is the case, if we're saying that men are the answer to addressing issues with regards to boys' behaviour and their underachievement and their poor attitudes to learning, then we're saying that women are the problem. And that can't be the case if we look back in history and the successes uh, that young children have had. The phrase male role model is something that I've spent a lot of my research trying to find out in terms of what is actually meant by that. And it's a hugely ambiguous term. So one of the issues, if you take the words male role model and particularly focus on male, what is actually meant by that? Are we talking about a man or are we talking about a role model of maleness? And when you look at the literature and you look at public and professional discourse, this idea of male role model is used frequently. But my research actually suggests that there is not a shared consensus about what is actually meant by the term. And that the idea of role model is a status that has to be earned. But there's no clarity about how you earn this male role model status and how long it takes. So it's very difficult for men to understand how you get into that. What's interesting is that we perceive the ideas of male role model as being a positive entity, but you can actually learn negative things from a role model. So if children, for example, look to footballers as a male role model, if they see footballers kicking others on their pitch or spitting, are they the kind of behaviours that you want children to learn? No, that's not. You know, right, so there's this sort of tension between how we perceive the role model in a positive or negative light. But what's of most interest is that when we think about male role models within the early years, it's very difficult for young children to actually articulate that idea of who's a role model for you because developmentally they're still at the self stage. So research with children in the primary sector actually highlights that children don't look to their teachers as role models. They're more likely to um, look to role models who might be considered their near peers, or people who are geographically, generationally, or experientially close to their lives, um, rather than the sort of sensational media stars that you know, some uh, children, or that some, uh, some people perceive as being role models for children. It's an interesting um, topic when you look at the literature. It, in the Western world, the absence of men in the early years is a, a keenly um, discussed topic, uh, one of the hot topics, uh, largely fueled by moral panic um, and statistics that sort of show, you know, on a global scale, you're looking at about 3% of men. Um, so, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, in China, um, in America, there are low numbers of men as role models. And governments, policymakers, and educationists are all looking into this and trying to get a sense of what it actually means to be a role model, what the benefits are for the children and for the adult who is emulating this role model entity. Um, but what's of interest is that we know that females can be role models for children as well. But if you look at the literature, that is glaringly absent in the discussion. And so what we need to be sort of thinking about are professionals as role models, rather than just focusing on one particular gender um, as the, the role model key. I only know of one recent study that has attempted to, to show the relationship between matching the gender of the teacher with the child. And interestingly, the results um, are they don't know what the answer is. What is interesting is there are virtually no studies that actually show that there is a positive correlation between matching the gender of the teacher with the child. If that was the case, Virtually all children um, would be disadvantaged in each classroom in some way because if there is this evidence that 
if you're a male practitioner, the, the children that are going to benefit most are the boys, that would suggest that the girls would be disadvantaged, which would then push the idea of having single sex classes. And because there is no evidence, it's, it's really frustrating for, um, you know, educationalists, for policy makers and for teachers and, and um, you know, governing bodies to sort of buy into this idea that we need to have this sort of gender balance because it isn't about the gender, it's about the pedagogy. The pedagogy is what will help the children to learn. And that's the thing that needs to be explored, managed and evaluated to show the success of the children's achievements. I was an early years teacher, a reception teacher. And one day I had a parent who came to me and said that you are the perfect role model for my child. And I was absolutely elated, went home and thought about it and thought, what does that actually mean? And when I came back to school the next day, I, I saw the parent on the playground and I said, I was delighted that you described me in that way, but what do you actually mean by role model? And she thought for a moment and said, I don't know. And I thought, how odd that you've used this label for me, but you don't actually know what it means. And that festered in my mind and served as the fuel for my six-year doctoral study into the ambiguities of being a male role model in the early years. That's a very good question. I personally don't think that we need to do anything. I think self-selection of the people who work in the early years sector is the most important thing because if you've got a passion for early years you will want to work in that way. There is a massive danger from my perspective that uh, head teachers, managers of settings may employ men simply based on their biological sex. And ultimately, someone is employed to ensure the learning development care of those they work with. So it's actually about the best practitioner. That's the critical thing. I think that it's important that we encourage men to consider it as an option but I think that they need to be very aware of the, the tensions and dilemmas that they will face working in the sector um, but personally I think it's a case of those that want to work in the sector should work in the sector. The idea of trying to achieve some sort of gender balance will never happen because that would suggest a 50-50 split and that's never been the case it would be interesting to see what happens if we're able to get more of a mixed gender workforce. But again, that's further research, which I hope I might be able to explore uh, in the years to come.